Can we uncover the Ramanujan summation using visual techniques? Let's find out. One of the most infamous formulas in mathematics claims that the sum of the positive integers 1 plus 2 plus 3 and so on is equal to negative 1 twelfth. Of course, this isn't true using classical real analysis techniques. The series on the left is a divergent series because its sequence of partial sums diverges. There are certain regularization techniques that allow us to make sense of this amazing formula. And there are plenty of other videos on YouTube that I'll link to in the description if you want to know more about it. In this video, I want to answer the question I often get, which is can we somehow provide a visual argument that this infinite sum equals negative 1 twelfth? In order to do this, we're going to need to investigate three different values. S is going to be the infinite sum of the positive integers. A is going to be the alternating sum, 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 and so on. And n is going to be the alternating sum of positive integers, 1 minus 2 plus 3 minus 4 and so on. To visualize each of these infinite sums, we'll use the following convention. A shaded filled square will represent a positive 1, while an outlined hollow square will represent negative 1. So the infinite sum s can be represented by a triangular array of filled squares, where there's one square in the first row, two squares in the second row, three squares in the third row, and so on. This is an infinite triangular array, with row n representing the positive integer n. The infinite sum a can then be represented by a line of squares where they alternate being filled and hollow. So the first fill square represents the number 1, the first hollow square represents the number negative 1, and so on. And then combining these two ideas, we see that the infinite sum n can be represented by an infinite triangular array where the odd rows consist of filled squares for positive numbers, and the even rows consist of hollow squares representing the negative numbers. But before we can actually use these structures, we first need to prove an auxiliary result about alternating geometric series. Start with a ratio r between 0 and 1. Consider the graphs of the function y equals x and y equals 1 minus rx. These are both lines, and they intersect at the point 1 over 1 plus r, 1 over 1 plus r. So the x-coordinate of the intersection point is 1 over 1 plus r. The vertical distance on the y-axis from the origin to the line y equals 1 minus rx is 1, but then the length of this horizontal line to the line y equals x is also 1 because of the isosceles triangle formed with y equals x. Now by plugging 1 into both functions, we see that the vertical distance between them at the point x equals 1 is r. And once again, the horizontal distance shown here also has a length r because of the isosceles triangle formed with y equals x. As we keep measuring vertical and then subsequent horizontal distances and spiral in, we see that by plugging in the appropriate x-coordinate, each of the horizontal distances will match the vertical distance of r to the n, and we get each power of r to the n as we spiral towards the center. Notice that because r is less than 1, our spiral diagram will spiral in all the way to the intersection point, which has an x-coordinate of 1 over 1 plus r. Now we can use the pictured horizontal line segments in an interesting way. We see that the first line segment represents the number 1, and the bottom one we can subtract off a line segment of length r. Then we can add a line segment of length r squared, and subtract a line segment of length r cubed. We can continue this process indefinitely each time we're adding the top lengths and subtracting the bottom lengths. As we do this, we get a length representation for the infinite sum of the alternating powers of r. Also, we see that this eventual length ends up being exactly the same length as the x distance from the y-axis to the coordinate 1 over 1 plus r. And that means that the infinite sum 1 minus r plus r squared minus r cubed and so on must equal 1 over 1 plus r. This geometric argument works for any value of r between 0 and 1, but it turns out that we're interested in something else. In the picture diagram, we have a ratio of 0 0.75 and an infinite sum of 0 0.5714. We can start changing the value of r, and we see that the infinite sum also moves as well as we'd expect to because it's the intersection point of the two curves. So when we shrink r all the way to 0, we get an infinite sum of 1 as expected. But as we raise r all the way up to 1, we start to see an interesting property, so that eventually, when we do actually make r exactly equal to 1, now our formula no longer works, and we see our spiral diagram just spirals between 0 and 1. Unfortunately, the spiral diagram no longer converges to 0 0.5 as we might hope. 
but we still have a good idea floating around here. We can shift r to any value we like between 0 and 1, and we get a convergent infinite sum to 1 over 1 plus r. Therefore, let's imagine taking r as close to 1 as possible without being 1, that is taking a limit as r approaches 1 from less than 1, and we see that the infinite sum will approach 0 0.5 or 1 half, and therefore the limit as r approaches 1 from the minus side of 1 minus r plus r squared minus r cubed and so on must equal the limit as r approaches 1 from the minus side of 1 over 1 plus r. But this latter limit can be computed by plugging in 1 and we get a limit of 1 half as expected. So this argument suggests that perhaps we could assign the value of 1 half to the infinite sum 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 and so on. It turns out this is essentially the obl summation for the infinite sum a that we want. And that means that this infinite line of alternating shaded squares and hollow squares can be represented by the number 1 half. Now let's imagine this infinite sum a and we consider two copies laid down horizontally and vertically and that allows us to multiply them together. 1 times 1 is 1, so is represented by a solid square, and 1 times negative 1 is negative 1, so can be represented by a hollow square. We can do this for the total infinite product, each time getting a solid square for a plus 1 and a hollow square for a minus 1. When we consider the infinite product, we end up with this interesting checkerboard type diagram as shown here. This represents the infinite sum a squared. We see that this infinite checker diagram does actually go on forever, but now we have our particular trick. We can take each column and shift it down. In particular, we shift column i down i spots. But then the resulting diagram has one solid square in the first row, two hollow squares in the second row, three solid squares in the third row, four hollow squares in the fourth row, and so on. In the odd rows, we have solid squares, and in the even rows, we have hollow squares. That means that we've produced our representation for the alternating sum of the positive integers. In particular, that means that a squared, which is the square of the alternating sum 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 and so on, is equal to the alternating sum of integers 1 minus 2 plus 3 minus 4 and so on. So a squared equals n, but a squared equals 1 half squared or 1 fourth, and therefore we see that 1 fourth equals n. So our value assignment to a, along with this checkerboard to triangular array argument, allows us to assign the value of 1 fourth to n. And now we can see our final visualization to assign a value to s, the infinite sum of the positive integers. Remember that this infinite sum s can be represented by an infinite triangular array of solid squares like this. And the infinite sum n, which is the alternating sum of positive integers, can be represented by this infinite triangular array, where the rows alternate between filled squares and hollow squares. But then we can imagine negative n as inverting that triangular array so that we alternate between hollow squares and filled squares as shown here. This allows us then to subtract n from s as follows. The odd rows cancel out because we have positive and negative values that are equal. In the even rows, we get doubling up. Because even integers are twice another number, and we're doubling them up again, we see that each remaining row in this diagram is actually four times the size of a row in a normal triangular array. But that means that s minus n can be decomposed into four copies of an infinite triangular array like this. And each of these infinite triangular arrays is itself a copy of s. But this visualization then means that s minus n is equal to 4 times s. And using a little bit of algebra on this equation gives us the desired result. First we see that negative 3s equals n, so that s equals negative n divided by 3. But remember that n was equal to 1 fourth. So when we plug that in, we get that s must be equal to negative 1 fourth divided by 3, which is in fact negative 1 twelfth as promised. So we've used a variety of visual arguments to somehow come to the conclusion that the infinite sum of positive integers is negative 1 twelfth. To do this, along the way we assigned the value of 1 fourth to the alternating sum of positive integers, and to do that we needed that the value of the alternating sum 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 and so on was 1 half, using the technique of obl summation. So while the infinite sum of positive integers equals negative 1 twelfth may not follow from standard real analysis techniques, we have seen one way to use visual arguments to get at this proposed result. 